Hello, good afternoon. Today, we're going to be having an exciting discussion. And obviously, today we have a trio. So our guests are really important people, Professor Gregory Price and Professor Warren Wat Watley. And we're going to be talking about the South Sea Company. So both men recently wrote a brilliant paper. I read all of it, all over 30 pages, titled, Did Profitable Slave Trading Enable the Expansion of Empire? The Asiento, the Negroes, the South Sea Company, and the Financial Revolution in Great Britain. So Gregory, I'm going to start with you. What was the South Sea Company and why was it formed? Okay, well, the South Sea Company was a uh... After the war of the Spanish succession in 1711, uh, the Spanish crown gave, gave relinquished the uh, exclusive contract to provide slaves uh, to the colonies in the, in the Caribbean, including Jamaica. And they gave it to Great Britain and Great Britain didn't know what to do with it. So this corporation formed called the South Sea Company, they agreed to take it and they said, what we'll do is we'll, we'll form a company and, and we'll swap out your debt for equity in the firm. And that was the primary incentive for the British giving it to the South Sea Company. And Warren, you want to add to that? If I just simplify too much, <clears throat> was that rough? That, yeah, was, that, was, that, was, that was pretty much it. I mean, um, um, Britain was emerging out of a pretty large war with Spain and France, against Spain and France. Um, uh, unprecedented in historic context. Um, they came out of that war with a huge debt um, and the, um, the uh, market value of that debt had sunk to a pretty low level. Um, people didn't believe that the government could um, pay back the money that they borrowed to um, fight the war. <clears throat> So um, uh, the government parliament, which was a relatively new body at this time, um, had control of, um, of public financing um, and um, set up this South Sea Company um, uh, in an effort to um, swap the, um, the high interest, um, low value government bonds that the government floated to finance the war into um, equity shares in this South Sea Company. Um, the hope being that um, that, could, that could reduce the, the government's um, cost of um, financing the war. Now the, the, um, the Asiento enters here because when when England sat down to form a peace treaty with, um, with Spain and France, they negotiated to, have, to get this asiento, which was a contract to provide slaves um, to the Spanish empire um, um, in the, the South Sea, the New World, basically um, uh, Mexico on down to South America. All right. Uh, so it was called when, the Negro contract. Probably. Yes. Exactly. It's called the Negro contract. Yeah. Right. So in Jamaica, history is quite extensive. We study the Tainos, 1492, to Portugal and Spain and their mercantilist policy. So I'm familiar with the Asiento and the French and the mercantilist policies of French and the other colonial powers of the time. The Atlantic economy is important for people. Of a, of, of a Caribbean background. So this form of scholarship is something that I've been reading for some time now. That's why I'm elated to have both of you. Interestingly, Gregory, when I'm doing research, I usually look at the academic works published by the writers. If, if, the, if the name sounds like a man, I assume it's a man. If it sounds like a woman, I've, I assume that it's a woman, but I didn't know that you were black. <laughs> I did not know <laughs> that Greg was a black man. <laughs> yeah, so three black guys talking about slavery and the slave trade. But Professor Watley, I wasn't really planning to talk about him, but I think we should. Who was Dr. Eric Williams? 
Oh, you're asking me? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Eric Williams, yes. You're more yes. of a Williams scholar than I am. Yeah, I yeah, know uh, you, you, you'd like to talk I, about I would, I would imagine, I would imagine Lipton is more Williams scholar than, than, than we are. Yeah, yeah. Than I am, at least. Um, but Eric Williams wrote um, Capitalism and Slavery, which is uh, a, a, a very seminal book, um, and um, which argued that, um, that slavery was instrumental in, um, in the success of the Industrial Revolution, primarily in England. Um, and, and much of the subsequent uh, research on that that um, that thesis. Um, the, the latest tends to confirm it. There was a while when people tend not to confirm it, but I think um, the evidence um, as it stands today is that yes, it was very important. Um, the remaining question is um, why England then abolished that slave trade, um, um, and and that's an issue that's that that still remains to be to be resolved empirically. Um, uh, Eric Williams, I think, then became became um, Prime Minister of Trinidad. Yes, yes, Trinidad and Tobago. Right. He was the first Prime Minister. So I, I follow. He also William. wrote a fame, he wrote a great book on the, the history of the West Indies. Yes, yes, I, I think it's called From Columbus to Castro. Correct. Yes, Correct. Dr. Eric Williams. Most of the people who have been writing on the legacy of Dr. Eric Williams are not from the Caribbean. I find that quite interesting. Many of the articles on the new economic history of capitalism are not penned by people from the Caribbean any at all. It seems to be primarily a North American affair. I've written some articles and I think that Joseph Inikori, he has a, a new article testing the Williams thesis and it's really simple. There was a link between British manufacturing and the colonies because British manufacturers were pro were producing goods for the colonies. I think that that's the vital link between that be between the British economy and the broader Atlantic economy. So Eric Eric Williams got some of his thesis right, but on the issue of the the Great Divergence, I tend to side with people like Joel Moker and Deidre McCloskey. Really? Yes, I do. I've interviewed Deidre McCloskey. I'm a libertarian. I tend to side more with people like Joel Moker and Deidre McCloskey. You, you attribute you tribute the, the prosperity of the West to the bourgeois values. The bourgeois yeah, bourgeois. Not, just, not just bourgeois values, but human capital. So there's this economist. I, can't, I, 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 I often struggle to pronounce his name. It's Jan van Luten. I, I can't remember his name, but he's a Dutch economist. And he and his co-authors, they, they wrote a book, The Long Route to, to the Industrial Revolution. And they basically covered pre-colonial, sorry, policies of the pre-colonial Western empire that aided industrial growth in European countries. So they looked at the European marriage pattern, finance before the Atlantic era, etc. So for now, I'm siding with, with that school. <laughs> Um, um, I'm a great admirer of both of those people, Deirdre McCluskey and Joel Mulcair. Um, Deirdre McCluskey um, uh, argues that there's a change in um, the, the value structure, liberalism, the rise of liberalism and its opposition to slavery. Um, Leave me alone, I'll make you rich, I think is the title. Yes, of yes, our, our new book, yes. That um, uh, that is definitely there's definitely a lot of evidence to suggest that it is there is a cultural shift that happens during the enlightenment of the 18th century. Um, it's also the century that um, that um, witnesses the humongous growth of the slave trade. Now, now. <clears throat> Now, Deirdre would call this um, um, an embarrassment, and and the liberalists tend to refer to it as an embarrassment. Um, uh, um, you know, being of that ancestry, I, I take it a little more seriously, thinking that it, it has long run um, social consequences more than an embarrassment. 
at a theoretical level. And um, the uh, the um, uh, the other thing I, I'd like to say about that and this issue is that there is a recent NBR paper out um, that actually uses the great British data set that identifies the um, Britons who held slave wealth. Uh, hold on, um, Professor Watley, is it the one by Stephen Redding? Because I know that he has a new paper. Oh, three that's... authors. Three yes, authors. yes I Stephen, have... I think he's one of the right authors. That's a, fab... that's a fabulous study. It's a fabulous data set. Um, and I think they get it right. And they basically show that those people, that the places where those people who held that slave wealth resided um, are the places in England that experienced increased investment in critical industries that drove the Industrial Revolution. Now, that's the best evidence we have of a direct, direct connection between slave wealth and the Industrial Revolution. And I think they do it right. Yeah, I, I think it's a good paper. I plan to interview one of the authors at some point. <laughs> but what I like about your paper, well, I'm thinking about you and Gregory, is that it, it, it has some parallels with an article I wrote recently for a libertarian publication because I argued that slavery and the slave trade are not unique, but as both of you are noted in your paper, Europeans treated the slave trade like an actual business. There was a managerial system to exploit people. So they created the Royal African Company, they were the Asiento, and I like your paper because it, in a, in a very strange sense, it is complementing the Noritian argument that institutions are important because the Asiento is a, is a, was a policy that aided the efficiency of the South Sea Company. So I think yeah, that- the first it, yes. Probably the first investment bank, the first investment bank in the debt for equity swap. So that mechanism, the debt for equity swap, although albeit public, but, uh, and, 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 and I think the kicker in our paper is that we showed, we demonstrated, we found evidence that the excess returns earned by the South Sea Company enabled the British to enhance their fiscal surplus which they can use to finance their imperial expansion because you got to finance, you got to finance your imperial project. The Asiento over that 40 year window enable them to buy the boats, the guns, the power, the troops to expand their empire. So that, that's the kicker. I mean, that's the most, that's one of the most important findings here. I mean, they use the returns of Asiento to finance. They were in position to finance their empire because you, you know, like, like, Pimping, being imperial in East, you gotta have the money, you gotta finance. Right. Boats and bullets cost money. Yeah. Do you have anything to say, Professor Watley? Pardon? Do you have anything to say and a, a comment? Do you have a comment? Um uh, about um uh, what in, in exactly? I'm they are sorry. saying to I know it aided the, the efficiency of the South Sea Company. Yeah. Um <clears throat> Um, I mean, we're able to calculate the profits directly from um, um, comparing the costs and um, prices, the costs of transport and the prices at which the Asiento slaves were sold in the Americas. Um, and we compare that with the stock value, um, South Sea Company stock value, and the two move together when the slave trade was profitable um, in terms of per slave and in terms of total profit, then the South Sea Company um, stock value increase per share, um, making um, the South Sea Company um, stronger, put in a stronger position to um, swap for the high interest bonds that the public was holding. Um, we also find that, um, that um, when ships left London, the, the, the month that ships left London for the South Sea, um, carrying African slaves from the coast of Africa, um, the South Sea stock price increased, the risk adjusted value of those stocks increased in that particular month. 
So um, people are looking at the ships that are leaving London. And um, if that ship is a South Sea Company ship um, headed for Africa and then the South Seas, um, people clamored to buy South Sea Company stock because they, they assumed or they projected as investors do that the future value of the stock will increase. Drive, thereby driving up the right. stock. And either of you can take this question. The financial revolution was important. How did the South Sea Company aid in the British financial revolution? I think that this is a relevant point. Anybody can go. <laughs> yes, what it did was it, it reduced the cost of government borrowing um uh, from i think around 18 percent during the period that the south sea company was swapping gov these bonds for stock in the company it drove it from 18 percent down to i believe um three percent eventually um and england was able to float the three percent console to finance its war efforts that's why the expansion of capacity you know led to um, uh, um england um, actually being able to push the, um, the French off the continental shelf of the United States in 1763, which of course leads to a whole bunch of developments in what became the United States, United States of America. Um, but it wasn't as all obvious that, um, that England um, would, be, would become the emerging power in the world. Um, back in before um, the South Sea Company was able to consolidate Parliament's ability yeah, yeah. to finance its wars. And, and maybe the fact that France <clears throat> had a difficult time doing this helps explain the other side why France didn't, didn't hold the, the continental North America. Boots and, troops, boots and troops cost money. That's right. Boots, they, cost money. It cost money. <laughs> So that's what they call the financial revolution, the sort of um, um, reduction in the cost of government borrowing, sort of increasing um, parliaments, the credibility of parliament's commitment to repay its debts. The South Sea Company and the Asiento are clearly major players in that whole revolution. So Gregory, the South Sea Company, the Asiento made it more competitive, but was it always profitable? Because when I was reading the, the literature and your study, both of you referenced earlier writers who doubted the profitability of the South Sea Company. Yeah, so we looked at we looked at another another measure of profitability. There's you know there's there's uh, the expense the expense side and there's a balance sheet. We looked at the, the balance sheet, right? The excess returns on the equity itself is a source of profit. That was heretofore not explored. You know, just the typical profit looks at cost and revenues relative to just looking at your overall operating costs, the operating side. We look at the balance sheet. Look at the balance sheet. That's another measure of profitability. Yeah. And that's the difference here. Yeah. And the whole did the South Sea Company respond to the broader market? environment because you Adam Smith was quoted in the paper and some were referring to the South Sea Company as a monopoly. So how was it integrated into the market economy more broadly? Well, Warren, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would have to guess that the success of the South Sea Company spawned imitators, right? So to speak of the bourgeois valley, the values and the institutions that, the institutions that embed that, I would dare say that the success of the South Sea Company spawned a lot of imit imitators after that, which uh, sort of uh, immersed a lot more agents into the so-called bourgeois commercial culture. Thanks to, and again, so I'm trying to attribute the primacy of the slave trade to the emergence of bourgeois values, commercial values, the institutions of financial firms. Yeah. Well, it's actually not a disparal. I know some people don't like when slavery is compared with capitalism because they both serve a different purpose. But I do remember reading the paper and there was an argument that p traders were selective about the type of slaves who were procured. So in every sense of the word, it was a business. 
so in, what, what's the yeah. opposition? So what, what is the what is the what is the chief opposition to viewing chattel slavery as a business? I mean, no, it? no, I, I'm saying some people don't like comparisons between capitalism and slavery. But how the South Sea Company was designed, which was a business, it may not be yeah. a legitimate business t- today or even back back then, based on one's preconceived notion. But it was a business. So profits were calculated, how insurance companies invested in it, and how slaves were select, selected because traders were specific about the type of slave that they wanted and even the era that they wanted the slave to come from. Yeah. Well, I think it's instructive to note that even, even prior to the establishment of the South Sea Company, there were earlier Dutch financial houses that introduced slave-backed, uh, slave-backed loans and assets. So the Dutch, the Dutch had financial houses that had a stake in slavery as well too, making slave back loans. As, as not not long after they sailed the, on the Cape of South Africa, right? So they set up financial houses with slave back loans. Yeah. Warren, I saw your recent paper on the impact of the international slave trade, and I think we're going to have a second interview to talk about that. But I'm interested in the link between institutions and the slave trade because i've read quite a bit of studies on the topic and i have i have a short article on the matter but i've never seen an academic study explaining how institutions made the slave trade more profitable so for example the royal african company the dutch west indian the dutch west india company the east india company how how did these companies function to advance imperial process what did these companies owe to developing countries? What do they owe to European human capital? I'm yet to see a paper on this topic. And since I've read both of you, I think you two are the right people to do it, especially since we're all of African descent. And many of these studies are written by non-Africans. Um, the Royal African Company, the Dutch East Indian Company, they, those were royal monopolies. Those were monopolies granted by the king um, to um, um, their select groups of people that some argue that they were inefficient. Adam Smith argues that they were inefficient in addition to the South Sea Company, that they were inefficient, but um, because they were monopolies and monopolies are supposed to be inefficient. It's when the South Sea Company's charter was abrogated and opened up to free traders that the British slave trade took off. Well, now, um, question may be, okay, so what did the, the, um, the Royal African Company do to um, improve the probability of those successes? Um, I think that's really not been studied. Um, but the, the Royal African Company did set up forts and factories on the coast of Africa that the, tr- that the free traders were then able to use. And the, and the Royal African Company um, and the venturers to, to Africa continue to play a political role in maintaining the forts um, on the coast of Africa up to 1850 or so. So it was always there, and you could think of it as providing some fixed capital and um, some, um, some um, market locations and nodes for the free traders once they, once they entered the market. Now, for the South Sea Company, the South Sea Company um, played a, a, a pivotal role, I would argue, um, in establishing the London stock market. Um, and, and, and this, the typical story there is that after the South Sea bubble in the 17, in 1720, 21, um, 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 it sort of proved the public um, willingness to hold stocks. And there were all these stock jobbers running around um, London um, during the, the bubble, um, the run up and run down of the bubble. Government comes in after the South Sea Company debacle, um, bails out the South Sea Company, um, and um, does a few other things um, on on the borrower side. But it's after 1720 that the London stock market takes off. 
And this gets back to what Greg Price was, was talking about, that the success of the South Sea Company and survival of this bubble, primarily because it had this South, this Asiento monopoly to fall back on, um, in a sense, um, demonstrates that the holding of equity shares, um, um, even in the face of, of a debacle like this bubble collapse, um, could be profitable, okay? So, um, so yeah, it's embedded in institutions. I would argue that the, this episode that we're looking at is, is a critical piece of the creation of um, the London stock market. And we know where that goes. We know that that's the central stock market in the world up until um, the late 19th century, actually till World War I when New York supplants it. But back to your earlier point about factories and forts in Africa, in a previous interview with Ellen Julia Paul, we were discussing the issue, but for those of us who did not listen, listen to the interview with Ellen Julia Paul, I will be reminding listeners that Europeans had to pay Africans to construct those forts. So there's a misconception that Europeans went to Africa and Africans were just sitting and looking at them. No, it didn't work like that. Many of the Europeans had to, well, not many, all of them were involved in trade with Africans, had to comply with African trading terms, and they were quite complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, um, a trade is a trade. It involves um, the um, participation of people on both sides of the market. Yes, yeah, but free, free, well, not frequently anymore, but I left high school uh, just a couple years ago, and when I was a student, we didn't really emphasize the agency of Africans, but with more research and greater exposure to knowledge, I've really fascinated, I yes. Yeah, well, the recent, the recent movie, The Woman King, underscores the role of agency in certain African empires, so that's... Yeah. Uh, Daomi, Daomi, Daomi Empire, yeah. but you know, look, the woman personal slavery what well, even today slavery is still practiced unfortunately in some parts of the world the warrior women of Dayumi, they were a product of their time so i don't think we can bash them for that engaging movie, that, that, that movie leaves a lot to be desired <laughs> okay. what's your I mean, problem the, with the, the, movie? the warrior the warrior king the, the those warrior kings started out as um as um, as the, the the king's uh, royal guard, because the king would not allow men to be in the palace after dark. Okay, and and then later on, you know, it it it, 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 it it's picked up by the Western press, um, uh, primarily in the late nineteenth century, when um, uh, when um, um, uh, the the kingdom, uh, Dahomey was fighting, I, I guess it would be the British who were trying to come in and-, and the, Maybe and to the conquer. French, they fought the French, they had many but let me, the can I, can, I, can I just interject here and, and suggest um, a, a previous article that I wrote? You might want to read that. It's about the gun slave cycle. Um, I think that puts this question of agency, um, um, it, 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 it corrects a lot of the misconceptions about, about agency. Um, uh, the, the, on the demand side of the slave market um, was a technology that um, improved the productivity of anyone who wanted to go out and capture slaves, either through war, through kidnapping, what have you. So that even if someone did not want to participate on the supply side in capturing people and exporting them, like Benin refused to do, like Congo ultimately wanted to do, boycott it all. Um, even if those societies um, did not want to participate, if there was someone in the vicinity that did, then they would capture some people, export them, get guns, and um, conquer all of those who did not participate yeah. in this exchange of slaves for guns. 
So, so we got a sub got a sub perfect outcome where it pays to participate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So 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 you know it takes on a life of its own. Walter Rodney was the first to note this. You know, it's 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 about who gets the guns, and if you get the guns, then the people around you are going to have to um, export slaves, which was the product in high demand, in order to get the guns to protect themselves. And there's example after example after example of how this is how the slave trade grew um, astronomically in the 18th and 19th centuries. So, yes. so agency, you know, agency is is there, but even that's embedded. You know, you got to see. It's endogenous. Uh, agency's endogenous. It's agency's endogenous. endogenous. It's endogenous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But studying the, the the slave trade is really complicated. There is a an academic, his last name is Malik. I plan to interview him at some point. I interviewed George Beaton some time ago, but it was not about his article on the slave trade. But there's, interestingly, there are some studies that seem to find a positive link between the slave trade and current development. Have either of you seen any of those studies? One is by, some, yeah, by Malik, yeah, Malik from... Uh, yeah, he, wrote, he published one recently. I'm yet to read it. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, Lipton, I'll send you a paper of mine where I look at the, where I looked at the intergenerational effects of slavery. In other words, past slavery affects the distribution of status today for Black Americans. So yeah, there are legacy effects, and that, and there are many papers like that. Look yes. at the effect of slavery on voting outcomes. The density of my my, my colleague Jacoba Williams looks at lynching post slavery. Absolutely. It does seem to have a memory if you do, right? It affects out. It, it seems to be able to affect outcomes today, and 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 it also um, um, explains a lot of the, um, the 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 underdevelopment of Africa, if I can use that for <laughs> underdevelopment. The, um, the and and it's the same thing. It's the same process. Yeah, more. What about Wanchikon's paper? Wanchikon's paper. Yes, yes, yeah, several. Yeah, the work with trust. With Nate and Nona. The past, yeah, there, there's, there's, there's a whole industry. industry of papers on that. Yeah, yeah there's trust, a whole industry of current papers. trust levels. Now, I'm past. arguing in that paper that you that you cited about the effects of the slave trade on Africa. You know, I'm arguing that all of that is because the slave trade expanded slavery in Africa, and we know how slavery and polygyny, and we know how slavery and polygyny absorbs savings. Yes. Okay, and we also know that slavery is the opposite side of the liberal credo, right? Of freedom and um, and growth, and a la uh, McCluskey and 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 Mulcair. So you have this sort of knife edge happening here. It's one part of the world where this liberal tradition, bourgeois virtues, are expanding, and then the opposite side of that slave market is um, Africa, uh, which is, becomes a place where those bourgeois norms do not take hold and do not expand. The, um, the line of demarcation there is slavery versus freedom. Yeah, well, when you mentioned bourgeois, the Asante empire just popped up in my head. There was a bourgeois class in the Asante Empire. The Fantis also had merchants. So currently I'm doing a lot of research to understand why those bourgeois values were never diffused throughout the society. But I think, again, that when people look at the great divergence, they don't study the role of bourgeois values in non-Western societies enough. So the merchant class in Asante, why did the merchant class in Asante dissipate? This was a popular question in the 70s, not again though, but I think that is still important. Yeah, but think about think about the accoutrements of the, bourge of the bourgeois life though. Think of sugar, tea, and apparel. All those accoutrements of, of bourgeois life were financed in no small part by the slave trade, right? I mean, you want your tea, you want your, your sugar, you want your fine apparels, you need slave inputs to get that down to make it affordable to a middle class. Yeah, right. So to be bourgeois is also to have the accoutrements, the fine teas, the fine uh, apparels. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, 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 I read the trilogy. The, the bourgeois values are quite interesting, but we're going to wrap up. But back to the Asante 
Emperor McCaskey. He has a paper on wealth in the Asante Empire. And I think that paper is useful for anybody who is interested in studying the rise and fall of the bourgeois in Asante and how culture can either promote or impede cap commerce. I'm sorry, um, you, you said Deirdre McCloskey has an article on the Asante? No, no, uh, Thomas McCaskey, the, 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 the academic, the Africanist, Thomas oh, McCaskey. McCaskey, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry. Not, not Deidre McCloskey. Um, yeah, that's an interesting debate. I mean, that's a debate about um, about Ivor Wilkes's notion of Big Bang in, on, uh, along the Gold Coast. Um, Ashanti, Ashanti is an interesting example. Um, a lot of the interest there is um, what was happening amongst the Akan who came together to form Ashanti when um, when the coastal Akan, Dikiranam, um, were um, beginning to participate in the slave trade. Okay, so Ashanti then pulled together, um, a powerful story, um, pulled together a bunch of the um, Ashanti, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the Akan um, chieftaincies and, and formed the Ashanti Confederation. Now, we know a lot about the um, Ashanti Confederation. Um, what we must keep in mind is that even Ashanti was embedded in the slave trade. Yes. Protecting itself from Northern Arab slave traders, from coastal slave traders, and then becoming a very powerful um, slave um, trading nation. I have a piece on the Ashanti Empire. Many of the slaves who ended up in Jamaica were from the Gold Coast and the Bight of Biafra and Bight of Benin. So right. there's a cultural link between Jamaica and the Asante people. And, and see, um, um, the Akan actually um, um, bought slaves from the Benin area. You see, the interesting part of this story is that Benin was not slave at this time, but Benin was an expanding commercial empire. And if you really want to look at the, the possibilities of bourgeois virtue and liberalism in Africa, I would suggest that you look at um, Benin before the Europeans came. Yes. And, well, and, Professor Watley, and, I have to end this segment of the interview because we can only speak for 40 minutes because of Zoom. So if you wish, I can send another link and we can speak briefly about Benin. Oh, you're an hour. Okay. No, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, yes, yeah. Sure. So let me yeah. just close this. But it's not just Benin, it's Zimbabwe. Yeah. Yeah. We have to close it. Do run out of time.